uh, view of this, uh, which you can of course and also uh, switch off and you're left with the uh, underlying uh, structure you created. So starting from this, I uh, roughed out a, um, uh, this kind of slipped a little bit, but it's of no consequence. Um, a B, let's imagine a client came and said, we, we, we need a B machined um, for uh, uh, whatever, a uh, sign in a store or just imagine something. So I prepared a little um, um, video to speed up uh, the creation of this, but it all comes down to uh, the construction of a um, flat, basically polygonal setup which is then inflated and converted into a, a T-spline mesh. Um, of course, I could just select this curve and extrude it with Rhino. And when I do that, I could bevel the edges and have a nice organic looking shape. But if you have ever worked with Rhino, you know things in the NURBS world are never that ideal. And I left this hard corner in here, for example, um, just for that purpose, because this is a uh, stumbling block uh, which will destroy the, the flow of the curves and, and force Rhino to make a break here and we will have a very hard time with that corner uh, to smooth that over into a nice beveled uh, surface uh, for the top of the bee, for example. So I don't want to um, stay on this topic for too long, but harsh corners, and there are a lot of issues with NURBS modeling. In the end, it's only a patchwork. Um, makes T-spline so valuable, as you can see in a second. Um, so let's take a quick look at this uh, video. Uh, I have to be a little bit careful here so I don't hit any buttons on my uh, webinar screen. <coughs> and this is the media player. Yeah, just as a very short um, introduction, um, we're here at the idea stage. Uh, we can, uh, in the Rhino world, as I named it here, uh, we can import meshes. Uh, we can convert them into T-splines, uh, which can be converted into T-spline meshes. After we are happy with uh, our construction, we can have Rhino NURBS meshes, of course, which we can also convert into Rhino meshes. Um, the word meshes is used a few times because Rhino Cam <coughs> is utilizing the meshes to create the uh, so-called uh, G-code, which is the data which is transported from our Rhino world to a physical machine. And the G-code, and you will see that in a, in a minute, is a very simple language which defines where a cutting tool should go. Then there's a machine controller software which converts the uh, instructions into actual moves of motors. And then we enter reality, which means noise, dirt, movement, shaping, happening, and uh, a physical result. So this is basically what we are running through here very quickly. Um, we're about to uh, get into this in detail. And I will pull this up as a roadmap uh, as, as we go. Um, here is a, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of made the screenshot because I said in the presentation um, on the web, uh, it's our Swiss Army knife. <laughs> so usually people put that off, but this is actually what I'm running around with all the time. This is the uh, Rhino Cam dongle. Uh, this is a memory uh, <coughs> plug with, which contains a G code which I carry from the office into the machine shop. Uh, to feed the uh, machine controller, is it? So literally, it's our Swiss Army knife. Then uh, this is the uh, machine prototype which we'll use um, to demonstrate this. This is a gantry. This is a uh, uh, for the z-axis, which moves up and down. The cutting tool up and down. This is a gearbox for that. Um, here's the motor which uh, moves the gantry from the left to the right. And uh, this machine is um, looks a little bit. Uh, skeletonized, but it's built for speed. The uh, machine is a 4 by 8, covers 4 feet by 8 feet, and can cut through the diagonal in less than one second. So this is a 4 by 6 uh, steel beam uh, with all solid aluminum on it, so you can imagine the forces on the motors um, to accelerate the machine and decelerate the machine so quickly. 
So we're using in this sample a, a very small cutting tool with a sixteenth of an inch diameter made out of a carbon, a carbide, solid carbide alloy and I can actually snap it off with my finger if I would uh, put pressure on it. Um, I just mentioned it so you can appreciate the accuracy of the toolpath generated by the Maxoft product because if, if there would be any hiccups in there it would just snap a bit off and um, of course the precision of the surface is generated by the T-spline uh, algorithms and uh, foremost uh, of course uh, our godlike skills to build a machine like this. <laughs> so um, I'll just um, let this uh, skip for a second. I just uh, used a very cheap uh, Vado uh, uh, camera which actually did a very good job in recording this. Um, so we have a gantry, we, have, we are using uh, steel loaded timing belts for this. They are, they are tensioned with about 300 pounds uh, and sound like a guitar uh, string and there is no flex, no movement, so this uh, saves a lot of cost. Uh, I wouldn't use this necessarily for a metal machine, but we can uh, stay within two thousandths uh, to three thousandths of an inch accuracy. So down here we have the uh, cutting spindle which we will use with the, uh, uh, with the cutting tool uh, in there. So, um, and the victim which is this board here. Um, then uh, we have uh, the machine controller. Um, the data arrives here, is converted into steps. Uh, this is uh, just a light show to see uh, for the prototype what is engaged, what is running, because sometimes motors are not spinning, but you can see a signal that helps a lot in, in, in the analysis of uh, errors. Here is the uh, high power servo drive suit we use and they co-developed. Uh, so this is the uh, system which is uh, powering the motors basically. Next to it is a uh, old IBM laptop which runs um, um, the machine controller software which talks through a USB port with that box. And I'll just try here is the so-called G code which you can see in a few minutes scrolling through uh, when the machine is running and here is a digital readout where the uh, machine is located, where the cutting tool tip is located physically in 3D space. Then there are a lot of options regarding uh, speed adjustments, coolant on and off and dust collector and so on. And next to it I just build up a little pile of cutting tools for um, the people who are not uh, um, familiar with those. This is called uh, ball end mill, a big one, half an inch diameter. Ball end mill because it is round at the end. Here is a flat uh, end mill. Here is a uh, V cutting tool. It's like a little pyramid. Uh, this is the tool, the brother of the tool, which is uh, currently chucked in the uh, spindle. Then we have all sorts of diameters, shapes, and uh, this actually is known as inappropriate tool. So that's why it smoked out a little bit. We tried a little bit with cheap router bits and doesn't really work. Um, here is a laser which I can chuck into that uh, spindle. The laser allows me with a very fine point to, pre to precisely position the spindle center over a part where I want to cut, so to set the coordinates. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, just to say the, if, if you have a tool which has a very bizarre um, geometry which is not in the library of Maxoft, then uh, the Maxoft software allows you to draw the tool um, shape, outline and define it and later um, you can simulate the uh, created toolpath and it will show the correct um, cutting geometry uh, while you define your own little uh, fantastic tool which you had made somewhere. Um, yeah, so basically that is this part and um, at this point I I will go back and go into the uh, the modeling part a little bit. So, Rader, as you go back to uh, to showing us how this is modeled, um, I think it's I mean for someone that sits in front of a computer all day, it's kind of amazing to me that it actually is going to the T spine design is going to come out of there. Someone asked a question; they missed the intro. How many axes is on your mill? Uh, we have actually, it's a, um, um, the way you see it, it is a four axis mill and um, uh, you can see we have those um, <laughs> actually screwdrivers. I sent Matt a very, very large 